is a special day because God got us up. We didn't just wake up, but God got us up. He has a new plan for us. Today's a day that the mercies of God are starting over. So no matter where we're at in this last week in our lives, whether we've had a good week, a rough week, or uh, just one from down below, God is here and he's with us. And he says, we have nothing to fear for God does not give us a spirit of fear, but what one of love, power, and of a sound mind. And that peace that surpasses all understanding is here today, available for each of us each and every day. Amen. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, you are so gracious. Thank you for waking us up to see a new day. A day that you created for us to worship you in. A day that you've planned good works for us to do ahead of us. You knew that we would be here this morning. We ask that you just come alongside of us. Encourage us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to be your witnesses. Help us to worship you in truth and in spirit today. Now, Lord, take captive every thought that's going through our mind. Bring them into captivity unto you. Prepare our minds for action. Prepare our minds for worship as we worship you this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Hold on, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Hold on, the battle belongs to you If you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. And all I see is a cross, God, he'll see the empty tomb. When I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you, there is fear I
officer, if you will, Lord, and telling us which way to go. And it's us as your army to follow your commands, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost teaching them to obey everything that you've commanded us. Lord, you said we should pray for those in authority over us. So Lord, right now, we pray for our president, our vice president, men and women in Congress, our governor, and those on the local level, Father. And the first thing we ask is, first off, is that they would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Do whatever is necessary, Father. And Lord, as they deepen their relationship with you, so Lord, open them up to your Holy Spirit and let them hear your voice saying which way to go. And then, Lord, give them wisdom to lead us your people well. Lord, the elections are coming up this week. And we pray that you in your divine wisdom would raise up the leaders that you have for us. Lord, that you would give them peace and wisdom to lead us well. Lord, we pray for our men and women that are in service of our country. Lord, they're scattered throughout the world. Some are serving in harm's way. And we pray right now that you would set up a hedge of protection round about them to keep them safe. That you protect them, Father. Lord, if they don't have a relationship with you, that they would establish that in these turmoilous times, Father. That you'd lead other Christian men and women that are serving alongside of them to 
lead them into a personal relationship with you. We pray, Father, for their families here at home. That you give them peace of mind knowing that you have everything under control. Nothing surprises you. And no matter where their men and women, their sons and daughters are serving you, Father, you're there with them. You've never left us nor forsaken us, but you're with them. Just as you were with us here at home. Thank you for giving us a country, Father, that we can freely worship you in. And we ask that you would take the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, and share it with the world, Father. Help us to do our part, starting first in our families and our community. And take it to the world, Father. Lord, be with our missionaries as they're serving you as well. Continue to raise the funds to support them and on the field and to help them to accomplish the tasks that you placed in their heart to do. Give them favor in the land in which they're serving in. Give them favor, Father. Let them win souls for you. Our Lord, we ask you would open up our eyes to see the wonderful truths of your word. Open up our ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us this day. Open our mouths that we might speak forth your word in our community and families, Father. Lead others to you. We've come with expectant hearts to hear from your servant this morning. We've heard that you're doing great things around us, Father. And we look forward to what you're going to do in the future. Now bless this time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First off, I want to say thank you for everyone who donated candy to help us reach out in the community event down at the... Uh, Christian Conference Center down in Seebeck, we had over 800 people pass through the convention center there. We were able to pass out bags of candy and tracks to 400 kids, and it was a blessing. We actually almost ran out of candy. I mean, we, we literally did run out of candy. Everyone was running out of candy. And uh, my daughter and Matt, they had a bag that they had kind of gotten into a little bit. Uh and uh, <laughs> but they shared that with us and we were able to end the night still with a little bit of candy left actually so that was a blessing it was a, it was really close <laughs> we were yeah, it was so close you could take the wrapper and that was probably the only thing left <laughs> amen well you know what we also have a little bit of family business to do today and you know what that is it's Judy's birthday today, <laughs> or this week, I should say. Today. today, today. Well, we need to sing happy birthday to her, okay? So, Bree, oh, it's going over there with John, okay. You ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Judy. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> it's, it's also her aunt's birthday today as well, and they're going to go out and celebrate a little bit later today. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. You know, it's part of family, right? It's just celebrating those milestones that we meet each and every day in our lives. And uh, I know James has a cousin whose birthday is this week, and uh, he is so blessed that, that he's able to share with him. It means a lot to him. Amen. Well, there's nothing better than fellowship, James. And 
That's right. That's right. We are. And we're, we're part of one big family here as part of the family of God. Another piece of business that I need to inform you about. And it's last week. First off, I just want to say thank you for being so faithful in your giving. You know, this is a little church that can. We've done a lot of great things together. And through your faithfulness, we were able this week to call back to AG Financial and pay off our mortgage. That's a big deal, my friends. You know, we, we paid it off early. We've been working on this for the last couple of years, and uh, that was exciting to uh, see that, be able to see that happen last week. And it's all I could do not to share it with you. And uh, we're going to have a, another time of celebration here in the near future. But we're going to burn the mortgage today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, Pastor Don, why don't you come up? This is Pastor Don Ross. He's our special speaker today. He is the, uh, the district superintendent or the district leader for the Northwest Ministry Network, if you call it that. Um, that's, we've changed the name over the years. And uh, he's going to be bringing forth the Word of God this morning. So uh, he's going to help us burn the mortgage. Yeah, let's burn it. <laughs> let's burn it. This is, this is one of the few times where the church is on fire, right? That's right. Amen. So uh, I'll let you do the honors there. Okay. We're going to just take it out of here because we don't need to burn the envelope and just kind of crumple, crumple it up. Can we do that? Make it burn a little easier? I like fire. Lots of good. So I'm going to hold this bowl while we burn this. There's uh, something that I want to say first. The Bible says in Psalms 127, except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. That's right. And God has built this house. Amen. God has built this house, and God has built this house. So would you stand with me, just as if you were holding this bowl? I'll make sure this works. Do I need to do something special? You do. <laughs> I don't know how to operate it. All right. Now it'll do it. Now it'll do it? <laughs> there it will. All right. Jesus, we are grateful for all that you have done. And Amen, so Lord. we just choose to set this mortgage on fire. I don't get to do this very often, but this is kind of fun. All right. So we just let this let this burn. I get it going well enough so I can get the paper going without my fingers, right? Yeah. All right. Amen. <laughs> We're burning the mortgage there, Pastor. Amen. Hallelujah. Say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, this is not going to set off a smoke alarm, is it? Probably. <laughs> Fortunately, well, we don't have any sprinklers in I'll tell here, you what. So. I'm just going to hand this off to Matthew, and you can take it out and finish it off outside so we don't do the, any of that. All right? Give the Lord another hand. Will you do that? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You know, God has blessed us so much. As each of you know, we've we did the remodel at the the, uh, the Whitney Hall, all in cash. We paid off the mortgage in the last two and a half years. Now think about this, okay? Eighty thousand for the remodel, all in cash. We had nearly 190000 owing that we've paid off in the last two and a half years. We put in three furnaces, brand new. We re-roofed the parsonage now, another 8000 We've been able to add missionaries. We've been able to help our missionaries in, in building wells and establishing churches in Romania. And that's all through your faithful giving. And like I say, we're the little church that can. Amen. Little church that can. Nothing's impossible with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayers. And God is going to do great things together with us as we reach our community. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Don. Yes, sir.
come and bring us the word. We've come with expectant hearts today. Good. I'm to ready. To hear from God speaking through you. So All right. uh, bring Thank forth you. the word. Thank you, Pastor Tracy. Hey, it's great to be with you. Um, as he said, I serve as the network leader. Our area geographically goes from the Pacific Ocean to the Montana border. And from Oregon to Canada, that rectangle, that's kind of our world. And we've got just under 400 churches and about uh, 1,400 ministers that serve the Lord in that area. Now, I know that there are lots of different denominations out there that love Jesus. I, I get that. And we are all sister denominations because there's only one heaven and there's only one Jesus. Okay? So... I thank God for all the ships in God's convoy and his flotilla that's out there. But we can only serve on one ship at a time, and this is our ship. And you you are part of that convoy, so thank you. We, we I want to take a moment and just say thank you for giving. Thank you for loving this community. Thank you for sharing the gospel with the people that you work with and your friends and your neighbors. It's not an accident that you live where you live or that you work where you work. God has placed you there as a local missionary. So let's pray, and we're going to jump right into the Word. Let's do that. Father, thank you for this day that we get to share together. We are honored as we serve you. I pray for this church. I pray for the godly men and women here that you are calling to serve you in ministry. Father, I pray that for the continued faithfulness of this church in supporting missionaries and sending out pastors and planting new churches, all that you have called them to do. I pray that you will equip them to do that. Father, we rejoice in the good news of paying off this mortgage and all that's been accomplished here in the last three years. Even during a pandemic, your blessings have reigned supreme as your people chose to be obedient. Bless our time together. In Jesus' good name, amen. I always like to share a little bit of where I got my sources. So inside your program, by the way, there is a listening guide. You can follow along and fill in the blanks, and hopefully we'll have those on the screen as we walk through it. I'm uh, grateful to the work of David Guzik and Tim Keller and Charles Spurgeon and Jonathan Edwards from a long time ago, and also Fox's Book of Martyrs. Those are kind of the sources for what I am sharing with you today. You and I live in a day and age when culture seems to reign supreme. In fact, it's during our lifetime that we have coined the phrase culture wars. And the Bible is full of stories where God's people lived in ungodly cultures but we're not controlled by that culture. And that's our current day. You and I are called by God to be wise in our dealings inside our culture as we serve him faithfully. Now, the story that we're going to look at today happened 600 years before Jesus was born. During the time of this story, the Acropolis in Athens was built in fact, Athens was founded during this time. The Mayans flourished in Mexico, and Aesop wrote his fables, and both Confucius and Buddha were alive in other parts of the world. And there was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. How many of you have heard that term, that name before? Nebuchadnezzar, that's right. And he was the ruler in Babylon, and he set up a 90-foot golden statue and commanded everyone to bow to this statue and anyone who refused to bow would be killed and three hebrew men named shadrach meshach and abednego refused to bow and we pick up the story here so with your permission i'm going to read through this story how many of you are familiar with the story i'm about ready to read okay hopefully we can learn some new things today that's my goal Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound 
of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. If you are ready, fall down and worship the image that I have made. Very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then God will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and his attitude toward them. It changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was their hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. Talk about going from hero to zero back to hero, right? That's amazing. Under the penalty of death and then promoted. Well, let's dig into this story because the Old Testament is filled with stories that talk about a physical manifestation of Christ. Now, these physical manifestations of Christ have a fancy theological term. It's called a theophany. And a theophany is when God appears visibly or audibly and impacts the scene. Every theophany tells us something about Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate theophany. Babylon was the world superpower of the day. And every time they conquered a nation, they instigated a strategy called subjugation through assimilation. Now, here's the way that that worked. They took all the scholars leaders, the wealthy people, the government leaders, of people of influence, and they took them out of their country and they moved them to Babylon so that uh, within a few generations, every culture would be forgotten. And that's what they did with the Jews. They took all of the notable people from Israel, moved them into Babylon so that within a few generations they would absorb all of their own culture and their values and all of the Jewish culture would be completely lost within a few generations. How, have you, how many of you know, though, that didn't happen? 
It didn't happen. God preserved that culture. So the book of Daniel is basically the story of four people. Daniel, who is a prophet, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now today, we're going to learn three things in this story. And you can write these down on your listening notes if you want to. Number one, we're going to understand what pluralism means because we all live in a pluralistic society. Number two, we're going to take a look at genuine faith. And number three, a perspective regarding suffering. So let's dive in. Here's the first one. Understanding pluralism. Pluralism is basically a system of multiple groups coexisting together. Now, that's our world today. We live in a pluralistic society. Now, in this world, in Babylon, the Jews were living in a pluralistic society, but they maintained their commitment to God. They were committed to civil authority. They did not rise up against the king. They did not disobey the laws. They fully cooperated. They had a Babylonian education. They worked in the Babylonian government. They were high officials in the Babylonian government, and they completely served God and the Babylonian government. However, they knew that a time was coming when their two worlds would collide. How many of you feel like you're living in a pluralistic society and your worlds could collide? Well, it does collide. In verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up? So let's talk about this image. It was a 90-foot golden image put in a public space, and it was surrounded by orchestras. And the decree was made whenever anybody heard the music, they had to bow in reverence and submission towards this image. And the decree said, if you don't do that, then you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. Now think um, huge cauldron, a, like a big bowl that was underneath that. So these men would be thrown into that or whoever refused to obey the king. Now, what did this golden image mean? If you read the entire chapter that I have talked to you about here in Daniel, you will never see that this image is given a name. It's not the image of or the image representing. And it's just image. That's the only term that's used. It's never given a name. And you might think that, well, this represents one of the Babylonian gods. But they had many gods. And so it couldn't be given one name. Nebuchadnezzar, though, gives us a hint at what this image means in verse 14, because he says, is it true that you do not worship the image of my gods? It could read, is it true you do not serve my gods by worshiping the image that I've set up? Now, this is interesting, and it makes sense, because the image of gold does not represent one god, it represents one culture, the Babylonian culture, which was made up of many gods. Nebuchadnezzar knows that Babylon is a multi-ethnic, pluralistic city. And it's just like the culture that we live in. Now, Sebek may be a small town, but it's just as pluralistic as Seattle or Spokane or Tacoma or San Francisco, or New York, because all of us get newspapers, and we have televisions, and we listen to the radio, right? So there's this pluralistic influence that impacts our lives. Nebuchadnezzar is saying to these three men, I'm not asking you to worship the gods of Babylon and turn away from your own god. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm just asking you to worship the gods of Babylon in addition to your own god. Did you know that that's why the early Christians were killed 600 years later after this story? It was not because they said that Jesus was God. The Romans didn't care. You want to believe that Jesus is God? That's fine. We don't care. The Christians were killed because they said Jesus is 
the only God, the only God. Now, this meant in Babylonian culture that three that these three men were called by Nebuchadnezzar to privatize their faith. So in public, you need to be Babylonian. You hear the music, you bow down, you worship the culture. In private, you want to practice all your Jewish traditions, fine, no problem. But in public, you're Babylonian. In private, you're Jewish. But in public, you're Babylonian. Everybody hear that? So pluralistic societies pressure people to privatize their faith. Your behavior is to conform. Now, it's interesting that Babylon, that Rome, and we see it growing in America, are pressuring us to privatize our faith. Now, what does that look like? Let me give you a couple examples of what it means to privatize your faith. Here's the first example. Let's imagine that you are a Christian business person. And there may be others in the same industry that you have, the same business, and they are just barely legal. This puts you at a disadvantage because you not only have to be legal, you also have to be moral. You have to be upright. You have to be trustworthy. You have to be honest. And you tell yourself, if I do business like that in competition with these other business people, I'm going to go broke or I'm not going to make the same level of profit. I know what I'll do. I'll just be Christian at home. I'll be Christian in private. But in business, I'm going to take my business practices right up to the line. I'm not going to break the law, but I'm going to right up to the line. Now, in that moment, you've chosen to privatize your faith because what you believe privately is only shown privately, not publicly. It's the equivalent of bowing to the image in this story. Let me give you another example. About 10 years ago, two sociologists from Oxford University in Britain did a study on sexual behavior in two groups of unmarried college-educated men, ages 18 to 23. Now, the first group of men in this study was raised in communities that were taught that there is nothing wrong with sex outside of marriage. The second group were taught... In ra and raised in churches and families that sex outside of marriage was wrong. The first group, those raised to believe that sex outside of marriage was okay, 23% of that group were virgins. The second study group, those raised to believe that sex outside of marriage was wrong, 28% of that group were virgins. There's only a 5% difference which is negligible. In other words, the practice was about the same. They said they believed one thing, but they practiced another way. They said they believed this, but their behavior didn't line up with what they believed. The study then went on to ask this question. Why is that the case? If your church tells you that sex outside of marriage is wrong and your family tells you that sex outside of marriage is wrong, why do you change your behavior and not line up with what you, are, you say you believe? And here's the answer. The pressure from culture is so overwhelming that unless deep conviction of faith, the behavior will always bow to culture. Are you hearing me? All right, let's roll on with our story. All pluralistic societies put pressure on us like this. All of us put pressure to assume that we will privatize our faith. Now, we need to see these three men that are called in Babylon as they were. They were called to help Babylon. They were called to serve Babylon. Just like some of you may be called to help civil authorities or to help your state or to help our government. 
We have many, many fine Christians working in the government today, working for our state, working in civil authorities who honestly believe that God has called them to help them. In fact, these boys received a Babylonian education. They had authority from the government. They were working in the government and they were working for the benefit. And do you know why? Here's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served the 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 empire of Babylon because years before the prophet Jeremiah stood up and said these words in Jeremiah 29 prophesying about how God's people should behave once they're taken into captivity here's what he said this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to those I carried into the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and daughters, give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease, and seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, this is interesting. It is entirely possible to be faithful to God and support your government, even when you disagree with the foundations. That's fascinating to me. Now, there may be a time when we need to stand up and we need to be prepared to do that. But until then, I'm going to pray for the peace. I'm going to work for the prosperity because that's what God's word tells me to do. They are working for the good of others. So you and I are Christians today. We are living under the same kind of pressure. In fact, if you don't feel the pressure from culture today, it may be that maybe you've given in. If you're in a group of people and you can hear the kind of language that's being used, the kind of attitudes that are surfacing, and if you don't feel a little bit alone, or a sense of pressure, or this thing inside you that you are to resist that kind of pressure from the culture, maybe you've given in. Are you resisting an ungodly pressure? The question is, this is not a political issue. It's an issue of faith and culture, because we live in a time when true faith is being tested. You and I will see true faith tested to a greater level than we've perhaps experienced ever before in our lifetime. So let's understand what faith is. Here's part two. What does genuine faith look like? King Nebuchadnezzar is angry now. The boys have straight up answered him. I mean, this is such a straight up answer. Our God can deliver us, and even if he doesn't, we're still not going to obey you. If we are thrown into the furnace, they said, we're still not going to obey. Although we believe God will deliver us, we're not sure, we know that for a fact, but we are not going to bow to the pressure. This is a remarkable response. Now look at the first part of their answer back to the king. O king, the God we serve can and will deliver us. Our God can save us. We believe he will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. These three men are saying we serve God and we serve God for himself, not for what he can do. Let me ask you a question. Do you serve God today for his blessings or because you love him? I want you to think about that. This is genuine faith. It's not transactional faith. Now, there's a comparison. I want to do a little difference here about genuine faith and transactional faith. What is transactional faith? Transactional faith is when we do something for God so that he will do something for us. A lot of Christians in North America live with transactional faith. Here's what it sounds like. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to pray, I'm going to tithe, I'm going to serve, I'm going to host a Bible study in my home, I'm going to follow the Ten Commandments, I'm not going to lie or cheat or sleep around or steal. 
God, I'm going to live the way you want me to so that you will bless me with a good life. I'm going to live a good life so that God will give me a good life. That's transactional faith. But listen carefully. Down the road, when something bad happens that I don't think I deserve, that's when I get angry with God. That's when I get ticked off at God. I kept up my part of the bargain. I didn't steal or lie or cheat. And now look what's happened to me. I've talked to people who have said, I've lived a good life. I've trusted God. But God did not come through for me. That's the way religious people live. They trust God for things. They do what's right for his blessings. And then when bad things come, they get angry at God for letting them down. That's how religious people live. But people of the gospel, people of the gospel, disciples of Jesus live differently. They trust God for God. They want the relationship with God. God is the pearl of great prize. And when suffering comes, which is the great testing period, people of the gospel are not the angry with God. They're upset. They're disappointed but they deal with it differently. You see, people with transactional faith will, will, will become angry with God and, and shout at him and say, why did I get fired? And they got hired. Why did my house burn down? Why did my husband divorce me? Why did my child have cancer? Why did my baby die? Why was I in a car accident? Why am I in a wheelchair? Why, why, why? And they point their finger at God and say, I did it right and you didn't come through. Because transactional faith lives like God owes us. We did our part. He didn't do his part. Genuine faith. Genuine faith treats suffering completely different. Genuine faith. People of the gospel come to God and say, I don't know why my wife got cancer. I don't know why I got fired. I don't know why my little girl was in a car accident. I don't know why these terrible things happened. But Jesus, I am so thankful. I have a friend like you who will walk through this season with me so that I am not alone. Do you see the difference? It's huge. That's the difference between genuine faith, which is focused on God alone, and transactional faith, which trusts God for his blessings and then becomes angry when we don't feel like he comes through. Well, these three Hebrew men, they are trusting God alone. They're not trusting God so that they'll be delivered. They're trusting God whether they're delivered or not. That's a huge difference. They said, we believe God will deliver us, but if not, we don't care. We're still not going to bow down. And by saying that, they have already won. They fireproofed their life in that moment. God will preserve their lives to serve him, either here on earth or God will take them home to heaven. They'd already won. They had already won. You and I, we can be fireproof too. Once we are willing to trust God for him alone, that he is the prize. Here's the third part, and we'll wrap it up. Let's take a look at suffering. What's our perspective on suffering? These Hebrews know that their response to the king, who's already angry, is going to make him even more angry. They're not trying to make the king angry. They're just telling the truth. How many of you know, sometimes when you tell people the truth, it makes them angry. Now, by the way, you need to tell people the truth in love. That's what the scripture says. And telling this king the truth is the most loving thing these three men can do. Nebuchadnezzar is furious. In fact, he's white hot with anger. And for the first time, he says to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been before in verse 19. The fire is so hot that the strongest soldiers are killed when they throw them in. Nebuchadnezzar then turns after the men are thrown into the furnace and he walks to a safe place. 
Now, there is a translation of the Bible called the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament Greek version of the Bible. And it tells us that when the king turned to walk away from these three men, he heard them singing. Heard them singing, and he turned around. He's shocked that they're not dead. The soldiers are already dead, but the men are not dead. And then he looks into the furnace, and what does he see? He sees a second thing that shocks him. There are four men walking around. And he calls one of them the son of the gods. Now Jesus shows up. This is the theophany here in this story. Sometimes you and I are aware of Jesus' presence in a fiery trial, and sometimes we're not. There's an old preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon, amazing man, came to Christ at 15 and pastored the largest church in Britain that grew to over 10,000 people, started pastoring there at age 19. Amazing. For almost 40 years, he was their pastor. And here's what he wrote about suffering in the furnace. God's people are often in the furnace, though there are different kinds of furnaces that serve a similar purpose in our life. There's the furnace that man prepares, there's the furnace that Satan prepares, and there's the furnace that God prepares. And God is with us in every kind of furnace. There's an English martyr. This story comes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. He's getting ready to be burned at the stake for his trust in Jesus. And he speaks to the crowd and he says, you look for miracles. Here now you may see a miracle for in this fire. He's talking to them while he's being burned alive. He says, for in this fire, I feel no more pain than if I were in a bed of down. But to me, it is a bed of roses. In the Bible, furnaces and fire are always metaphors for trials. And in this story of these three promises, they're in the middle of the suffering. God gives us three promises regarding suffering. First of all, here's what you need to know. Suffering will happen. If you breathe, you will suffer. Period. That's it. It's just part of life. Job 5.7 a man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. First Peter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now think about this. Because Americans struggle with suffering. We struggle with that. Most Americans don't think that we should have any kind of suffering. In fact, most Americans think that if we are suffering, something is wrong. Most Americans think that they should be able to live their life kind of as God's darlings and, and no suffering should come into their life. I've talked to people who said, hey, I have lived a good life. Why should I be suffering? I've lived a good life. Well, think about this. Jesus lived a perfect life and suffered more than anyone. Living a good life is not an antidote for suffering. Here's the second promise. Suffering develops character, just like fire purifies gold. 1 Peter 1. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your proven genuineness of faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Your faith, your character is refined by fire. Impurities are removed during the purging process of the fire. What does fire do to gold? Fire turns the gold to the liquid so that all the impurities will rise to the surface so that they can be removed. That's exactly what happens to us when we go through suffering. Our character is changed. Our weaknesses are removed. Consider these four questions. Do you want to know what's in your heart? 
Do you want to be a compassionate person? Do you want to have a deep trust of God? Do you want to be wise in life? Only suffering produces character traits in your life. And only suffering is where your faith is genuinely tested. You will only genuinely empathize with someone who's going through suffering if you have been through suffering. You'll never be able to fully trust God until you've experienced a deep trial that requires deep trust. And only suffering will help you become wise and understand how life really works. Suffering develops character like fire purifies gold. Suffering alone doesn't make you wise or compassionate. It takes more than that. You need to know and see that Jesus is in your life in order for character to develop, which brings to the third promise of suffering. Jesus is with you and I in the fire. We need to know that in our suffering, which is always very personal. It, it's impossible for you to go through suffering without it being personal. If you've gone through any kind of suffering at all, it's personal. It is, isn't it? And it's hard to compare one person's pain with another person's pain, except that you both suffered pain. Jesus wants you to know that you are not alone. When you go through the fire, you are not alone. When you go through hard times, you are not alone. And listen carefully. You don't have to feel his presence in order to know that you are not alone. His word promises it, so it's true. Listen to this scripture from Isaiah. Do not fear. I've redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Who is this that was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire? Who is it that is referred to by Nebuchadnezzar as a son of the gods? Nebuchadnezzar does a good job of describing who it is because he doesn't just call him a son of the gods. Later on in verse 28, he refers to him like this. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. Now, in the Old Testament, there are angels that God sends, but then there's also the angel of the Lord. And whenever you read the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord speaks like God. There is God in visible form. It's a manifestation of God. It's the theophany, the pre-incarnate Christ. How can we get ourselves to a place that even in the middle of suffering, we recognize that our character is being turned into gold? Here's how. We feel Christ in suffering in our own furnace to the same degree that we know that Christ was thrown into the ultimate furnace for us. In other words, when you're going through hard times, remember Jesus went through harder times times than you so he can be with you in your hard times if you remember that jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace of hell for our benefit then while we are in the smaller cooler furnace we'll recognize that we are not alone jesus is the fourth member in the furnace with us in 1739 a famous preacher of his day, Jonathan Edwards, wrote an amazing sermon. It's called Christ's Agony and talks about Jesus in the garden. Jesus is struggling with the cup. For the first time, God has revealed to Jesus what he's about ready to suffer. Now, he knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that he would die. He knew that he would be raised from the dead. But Jesus didn't have the full details of what lay in front of him. And in the garden, the Father lays it all out before him. And he wrestles in prayer and agony so much so that he sweats drops of blood. Here's what Jonathan Edwards says. 
Jesus had a close view of the furnace of God's wrath into which he was about to be cast, a furnace vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. Jesus was brought in the garden to the place where he viewed the raging flames that he might know what he was about to suffer. There was the thing that filled him with sorrow and darkness. This was a terrible sight as if overwhelming him. The gospel means that you and I, because we don't love God as we should with all of our heart, or love our neighbor as we should, like ourselves. We were built for God's presence, but to lose God forever means to be cast in agony into that furnace. But Jesus came to earth on the cross, and he experienced the wrath of God for us. The very wrath that would have been poured out on our life, Jesus took on his life. He was thrown into the ultimate furnace that all of us deserve for our sake. And when we believe that Jesus took on himself God's wrath, the wrath that we deserve, that none of that comes on us. We are free because Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty for us. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 29, no other God can save this way. And he's completely right. There is no other God. Think about this. Every religion in the world says that you must do something to achieve salvation. You must live a good life. You must behave this way. You must practice this. You have to do something in order that God will save you. Now, how does that kind of belief measure up when someone goes through suffering? Follow me here. When suffering hits you and you believe that you're trying to live a good life, you will either find yourself hating God because you've lived a good life and you're asking, why is this suffering coming upon me? Or... You will beat yourself up because you know you didn't live a good enough life and you deserve this kind of suffering, and both are wrong. Both positions are wrong. Every world religion teaches that the way you find salvation is based on something you do, your moral living, doing right works. And if you go into the furnace of suffering with that belief, it will destroy you either because you are mad at God or mad at yourself. But when you're thrown into the furnace and you have a reliance on Jesus, when you trust in him, then you can say in this smaller, cooler furnace, I am not being punished for my sins. Jesus has already been punished for my sins. And I trust in Jesus so that suffering in this furnace will only make me better. If I can go through the ultimate furnace if Jesus can go through the ultimate furnace for me, then I can go through this smaller furnace for him. Jesus suffered not to keep me from suffering, but so that when I do suffer, I become more like him. I want to say that again. Jesus suffered not to keep me from suffering, but so that when I do suffer, I become more like him. If you remember that Jesus Christ was thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, then you will sense his presence when you are suffering and going through the smaller, cooler furnace of your own pain. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Maybe you're going through a period of suffering in your life right now. And you're trying to figure out what God is doing and how you can cooperate or maybe you're angry. Maybe you're angry with God because you think you did things right and you don't deserve this. Or maybe in your heart you know that you've not lived the way God wants you to live and you do deserve this. Neither one of those is right because neither one of those positions trusts Christ. I want to encourage you right now 
If you have never opened your heart to Christ before, I want to pray with you. Jesus is standing with his arms wide open saying, welcome home. Come, come to me. And I want to pray with you. If you've never invited Christ into your life, I want you simply to open your eyes, look directly at me right now, all across this room. I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you in any way. I'm just going to pray for you. Okay. All right. Maybe you're going through a period of suffering right now. And you don't understand why. And you don't have the endurance to continue, but you want to ask God for that. You want to say, Father, even though I'm going through suffering and my faith may be imprecise and I'm confused, I want to believe that I am not alone, that you are with me in the middle of this pain, and I'm trusting you. If you're going through pain right now in your life, if there's a measure of suffering, don't compare yourself with anybody else. If you are going through suffering, I want to pray for you right now. Just simply open your eyes. Look directly at me all across this room. I'm going to pray for you. Okay? 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 So that that suffering will not be in vain. That it will produce character like refined gold. So that you will be more like Jesus. Who suffered not to keep you from suffering. But so that when you do suffer, you become more like him. Jesus, we know and we understand that those of us who follow the gospel will go through suffering. And we pray that hate and anger and frustration will not manifest itself in our life, but instead a full trust in you, that the gospel will shape our thinking. Give us the ability, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego had, to, to boldly declare we don't need to defend ourselves. We will not bow to the pressure of an ungodly culture, and we will trust you in the middle of our suffering. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your good name we pray. Amen. 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 Pastor, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Don, for bringing the message of hope in a time of suffering. We don't hear that too often in the world out there. And what the world needs is hope. And that hope is Jesus. And one thing that we have that we can give to those around us is Jesus. So no matter what goes on this week, no matter where you're at, whether you're in school whether you're at work or in the grocery store, wherever you are, take the word of Jesus with you and offer them that hope, that peace that the world so desperately needs. Just keep on your horizon. Begin to pray now for Christmas. We start our Christmas series in three weeks. And it's home for Christmas. And the number one place that people need to have is a place that they can call home. We always say we're around here, welcome home. That's because we want people to feel at peace with God. And we need to start with our families. Christmas this year is on Sunday. So plan now. How are you going to center your celebration of the life that Jesus gave for us when he came to earth, how you are going to incorporate the worship of Christ on Christmas Day. I would encourage you, take time out. You know, it's, The kids are going to be bright and awake, bright and early, probably at the crack of dawn to open those packages. You know that. But take a break. Come worship with a family here at Christian Worship Center. It'll only be an hour long, but I can promise you it'll be a time where we can incorporate what the true meaning of Christmas is all about with our families because we need to pass it on from generation to generation to generation. Amen? Amen. Well, as always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now, friends, may you go in the blessing and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ into your harvest field, into your mission field, into your homes, into your community, and do the great things that God has planned ahead of time for you to do. And I look forward to hearing those reports next week. God bless you. Have a great week and go with God.